Got it's a pleasure to have uh, David Gossor from Sakrae. And now, uh, also, this is concern, and he will be telling us about finance and evidence. Thanks. So, this is actually going kind of in the same direction as uh, Fernando's talk yesterday. It's definitely on the amplitude side, and uh, it's more technical kind of uh, about structure and about specific results. And uh, it's work that is done in collaboration with uh, Pavel Novichkov, who's a uh, postdoc at Sacre, and uh, Giulio Gambuti and Lorenzo Tancredi. Uh, Giulio's a uh, student at Oxford, and Lorenzo was, uh, was his advisor, escaped to Munich, leaving Giulio behind. So, um, bases of Feynman integrals is this kind of appeared both from integrand level and integrated level in yesterday's uh, talk are some of the key building blocks for scattering amplitudes. And of course, as we now know, scattering amplitudes are one of the ways, one of the building blocks, in one of the ways of computing uh, gravitational waves and other observables. And the idea here is to explore a new organization of bases and to try to, to do that in degrees of divergence uh, in epsilon. And so, I mean, that's a very long range program, but uh, the first steps that I'm going to show you today are to how to find finite integrals and also how to find uh, integrals of order epsilon, and then how to and just mention that those can be used to find new relations uh, that reduce the number of basis integrals uh, being used. So of course, this is all in the context of uh, dimensional uh, regularization. So D is four minus uh, two epsilon. And the integral types uh, among the finite integrals that one can imagine, there's actually further uh, sub Classes. There are things which are we're mostly going to focus on, which are locally finite integrals. Where the uh, integrand, where the integral is integrable everywhere in uh, momentum space. And then there are things which I call uh, evanescently UVIR finite or evanescently IR, IR finite, where there's, in a certain sense, cancellations between either UV divergences and extra factors of epsilon from the IR, or similarly for IR. And there, there for the UV ones, it's fairly a straightforward uh, way to classify them generally. We don't really understand how to classify the second, the last category uh, generally. And then part of the ingredients in those last two are evanescent integrals, which is what I call integrals, which are order epsilon higher than So um, how do we go about doing this? So we know that in general, in the animals and in gravity, the singularities are associated with uh, the logarithmic, they're soft and collinear regions, but we're not going to uh, assume that from the outset and kind of the output of, uh, of the procedure. So we're gonna systematically look for numerators that uh, remove singularities. And once we have those, we're also gonna systematically find numerators that vanish in four dimensions. That's what will give rise to integrals, which are manifested with epsilon. And then we'll see how to reorganize those numerators in nice forms. So just as a little bit of background, kind of the way to think about this, let's uh, let's go back and look at one loop. So we all know there's the canonical basis, box, the triangle, and the bubble. The box and the triangle have one of the epsilon divergences, and that's those are IR in origin. And the bubble has one over epsilon divergence, which is UV. Now we can imagine treating the Four dimensional box would be four minus two epsilon dimensional box, which has a one over epsilon divergence for a uh, d equals six uh, box, and that's a finite object. It's, it is sufficiently low dimension to not have UV singularities. In general, they're not going to be, at least in Yang Mills, they're not going to be 
IR divergences in six dimensions. And that's, you can write down a, a standard kind of reduction equation that writes the four dimensional box in terms of the six dimensional one in a bunch of triangles. And so then when you do that, all the IR divergences get isolated in triangles. That's, that's kind of the longer range vision is that you want to isolate the IR divergences in a smaller set of, uh, of integrals. But we're just taking the first step today. Okay, so just a little bit of notation. Um, use the notation that uh, when there's some polynomial and duple momentum in brackets, that means that's the numerator. And the denominators, of course, are determined by the topology of the final integral. We'll also be making use of, of uh, gram determinants, so which are just uh, your two sequences of uh, momenta. And you just take the determinant of their dot products. And the utility of this object is that whenever two momenta in the upper row, or equivalently two momenta in the lower row, are collinear, then this thing vanishes. And also, it uh, it scales, of course, with powers. Of, uh, of each of the uh, Ki or each of the uh, Qi. So for example, um, if at one loop, if we look at a box and we put this particular gram determinant involving the loop momentum uh, into the numerator, then we get a finite integral. In fact, that turns out to be the, the six dimensional box and that's relatively easy to demonstrate. So, now there's a similar relation uh, for the pentagon. We can write the uh, four-dimensional pentagon uh, in terms of the six-dimensional pentagon, and then there's a collection of, of boxes. And uh, the six-dimensional pentagon again is, is finite. And but what's novel here is that this coefficient d zero is actually of order s. So if we're only interested in computing, let's say, a one loop amplitude through order of epsilon to the zero, so if we do it's the next leading order, then we can actually draw uh, the pentagon. And uh, that, thanks to this, this which is uh, I call an evanescence relation or evanescence relation. And again, this relation you can generate from an integral which um, is has an insertion of a particular gram determinant uh, in the numerator. And uh, you, can, you can show, we'll, we'll see this uh, a little bit more in detail later, uh, that this integral is manifestly of order epsilon. The integrand, of course, is non-vanishing. And then if you evaluate this in two different ways, you basically get the two different sides of this equation. You can rearrange that this, um, this equation to, to tell you that the uh, pentagon can be written as the sum of uh, four boxes plus something of epsilon. And so what we'd like to do is generalize all of these ideas to, to higher orders. So let's uh, look back, and I realize some people in the audience know a lot of this already, but I'm trying to do this also that folks who don't have it at their fingertips. So let's think a little bit about how do infrared singularities arise. So they arise from regions. We have some integral, say, imagine right now in the loop, there's some number of, of uh, propagators. So they're going to be arising from regions where the denominator uh, vanishes. And uh, generically, when one denominator vanishes in four minus two epsilon dimensions, the integral it's still integrable, so there's no one of epsilon in depth. If you have two denominators that vanish in an invariant independent way, then you'll get a one over epsilon singularity. And if you have three denominators vanishing in an invariant independent way, you get a one over epsilon squared singularity. And generically, that happens when you have two adjacent propagators that are separated by a massless leg. That's how you get two denominators vanishing. So in that in the notation of the previous slide, then the difference of the two uh, sums of momenta in those propagators has to be massless. And the singularity arises from the region of integration where the loop momentum is collinear with that massless external leg. And uh, generically, 
The way you get three denominators to vanish is you have, they have to be three adjacent propagators, and each of the pairs are separated by a massless uh, vector. And the uh, singularity arises when the middle momentum is then soft. So in the notation of the previous slide, when the loop momentum here is roughly uh, around uh, K2. So it's K2 plus some small, uh, small quantity. And again, we want to understand how this, uh, how this generates. So um, we're going to proceed topology by topology. So we draw our, our, our climate diagram and then we solve the lambda equations in momentum space representation. I'm not going to go through that uh, in detail, but there's, there's two uh, equations. Basically, you, you either have the derivative of the denominators, summed over denominators. Okay. What's the Lando equation? Uh, the Lando equations. Oh, I see. Okay, maybe I should. Or, uh, yeah, you can write the book. Um, I don't think I have. I have that. But basically, it's um, the the conditions here are when the denominator vanishes, and when that vanishing is um, is essentially pinching a contour. So you cannot deform the contour of integration to avoid that singularity. That's what we're going to ask. And uh, when you work through all the algebra, you find them, you get them in, in this form. There's one that's a derivative equation, and there's one that's a sum equation, it says either basically the corresponding alpha, which turns out to be a Feynman parameter uh, in disguise, is um, cares about my internet connection, but um, or the corresponding denominator uh, has to vanish. So these are ultimately some sets of, of the equations, linear and quadratic in the loop momentum, uh, which you solve. And um, there are certain conditions on these alphas. And as I just said, they can have the interpretation of, uh, of Feynman parameters. In, for non planar integrals, there's some additional subtleties. You, you may have to break the momentum conservation in order to have a, a Euclidean region. But uh, other than that, this whole, uh, this whole procedure uh, goes through. So each solution is a singular surface, a place where there is the potential singularity of, uh, of the integral. And it turns out in practice that, um, let's say in planar integrals, these are all uh, logarithmic, and um, they are all associated with soft or collinear. It's a little bit more subtle than the non -planar. And so the, the analog of these, these two uh, propagators or three propagators vanishing are whatever comes out of the solutions of, of the Landau equation. Because we have multiple loop momentum, things can be more complicated. Combinations of loop momentum being uh, proportional to something, etc. So, um, in the, the planar case, which is mostly what I'm going to focus on, then, as I said, what what comes out of this procedure are a set of, of potential logarithmic and uh, collinear singularities. And then, what we need to do is examine each of these singular surfaces uh, one by one and look at the at the scaling. Uh, of the integrand around that to understand whether something is actually divergent or 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 convergent, and that scaling is is based on um, much older work by Libby and Sturman, but it's kind of in a in a form which is suitable for loop integrals. It was written down about five years ago by uh, Babis Anastasi and uh, George Sturman, and that's what we're going to follow. So. Generically, I mean, L here might actually stand for um, L minus K or some, some weighted sum of loop momentum, et cetera. But when you've isolated uh, that momentum, then you set some, I guess you could put in some constant uh, vector and then set there's some hard scale Q and you scale it with uh, lambda squared. And again, generically, the collinear surface is where you're going to get some combination of loop momenta that is proportional, so some constant of proportionality alpha to an external massless momentum. 
And there you're going to parameterize it in this form. There's, there's a part which is going along the massless momentum, and then there are orthogonal directions. One is given by eta, which should also be a light light vector that is not collinear to K. And then there's an orthogonal direction, which should be orthogonal precisely in this sense, both to K and, uh, and to eta. And you put in these particular scalings. And then if you have any rational function of the original uh, loop momentum, you can determine what the scaling is at this particular seeding surface. And if the scaling is lambda to zero or higher, then it's divergent. If the scaling is negative, then it'll be divergent. So we have the denominator. So we know if you look at and see where the divergences are in the scalar interval. But the idea here is to try to build numerators that will get rid of the, uh, of the singularities. So we start with all the factors that we can build out of the loop momentum. So for example, in the two loop case, uh, there'll be each of the loop momentum squared or their dot product. These are degree two in the loop momentum. And then we can also dot each of the loop momentum into the external momentum, and those are degree one. So now we're going to build all numerators of some fixed degree. So for example, degree two, we have some coefficient times L1, L2 plus some coefficient times uh, this cross product times plus some coefficient times L1 dot K2 squared and so on. And so forth. And of course, we can do this at, at higher and higher uh, degree. And so now we plug this into the uh, scaling uh, equation, you know, the, the scaling machinery. And we do this, we iterate over each solution of the lambda equation. And we now require that any term which has singular scaling has to vanish. And that gives us a set of linear equations for these coefficients C. Okay, so we have a system of equations from combining all the singular surfaces and we can solve uh, that system. We do that separately with each degree of numerator. And finally, the um, we require UV finiteness just by, by power counting, essentially. You have to have overall UV finiteness and then UV finiteness for each uh, loop independent. And that, that's ultimately going to uh, put a limit on the degree of, uh, of each of the numerators that can, uh, can rise. So, uh, Okay, so this is uh, kind of the simplest example. So we're looking at the, the planar double box. I guess, does everyone know what the planar double box is? No. No. Okay, um, I should have uh, should have put the uh, picture on the board. So it's a four point integral and um, with two loops. Uh, oops. And conventional labeling, which is what we're using here, L1 and L2. So if you, um, so and this has, it has seven propagators. And if you put this particular uh, numerator into it, then you'll get a, a finite uh, integral. So let's have another show of hands. How many people find this form of the linear medium? How many would agree it's not very linear? A lot of people are kind of uncertain. It will allow you not to, not to respond. Okay, so um, in fact, there are, in this case, uh, 31 different solutions, so 31 different uh, singular surfaces. And uh, if one goes up by, by degree, you find that uh, there's nothing linear. It's not too surprising. Um, there are two independent ones that are degree two, 18 of degree three, 89 of degree four, 247 of degree five, and degree six is already runs into the UV uh, cutoff, so we can't have any there. But it's very clear these are not all uh, truly independent because suppose you had some finite numerator and then you multiply it by some arbitrary polynomial in the loop momentum, as long as you're satisfying the overall 
uh, UV power counting, uh, then you're again gonna get a finite medium. So some of these are clearly gonna be trivially related uh, to others. Why do you go so high phase two mass spectra? Can you just two? No, so this, this is all done before, this is all done, this analysis is done before I do this. It's just an analysis of the, the set of finite images. IDPs are something you need later. It would be interesting to understand how to combine them with the set, but that's more understand. complicated than, than uh... Okay, so, um, so that structure, as is probably clear to a very small minority of the audience, is uh, is the structure of an ideal. And so what we want to do is to understand how to manipulate uh, ideals. And for that purposes, I thought I would take a few minutes to give what I suspect is foreign language lesson to most, most people uh, in reference. So in a more abstract way, we're studying uh, systems of, of polynomials in certain variables. The variables here are the monomials in the uh, built out of the loop momentum. And we start out with some basis polynomials. Those are the ones that come out of this procedure and the numbers of them are, are given on the previous uh, transparency. And these are called generators, generators of the ideal. And um, for our purposes, the coefficients here are going to be numbers or perhaps uh, rational functions of the external invariants. In this in four point case, we've just been T. And we want to consider all polynomials that are built out of these by multiplying by other polynomials. So Q again are polynomials. You take some arbitrary polynomial in the same variables and you multiply by them by your generators. And then you get that set of, of all those polynomials is called the ideal, ideal generated by the uh, P sub J. And it has the implication of, uh, of angle variables. So the, the usual use of this in, um, in computational algebra and geometry is you're interested in the simultaneous solutions of all these, um, all these polynomials P, determining properties of those solutions. And um, when all those polynomials vanish simultaneously, then the, um, the Qs will all vanish as well. So think of this as kind of being all the functions that vanish on, uh, on the simultaneous zeros of, uh, of all the polynomials. So the kinds of questions we wanna ask, and uh, in particular in the context of, uh, of these numerators is what's the simplest set of, of polynomials that can generate the, the ideal? There can be many different ways. Clearly, if you took, for example, the sum of two generators and the difference of them, you're going to generate the same, uh, same idea. And then you also want to ask the question, suppose someone, suppose you're walking along the street, you need an ideal, and then you want to ask, you know, is some polynomial that you've just dreamed up, is that, can that be written in terms of the P's? In other words, is it a member of the ideal? Is there some way of recovering these coefficients? It's actually not something we, we care about deeply today, but it's it's potentially important. And then something that's not of interest today, but it's it's something uh, that one can ask with the same technology. Are these equations consistent? Is there is there actually any solution to the common system of equations where all of these are uh, are set to be zero? So. In high school, you presumably learned how to do polynomial division and, and things like that in a single variable, and that's a very simple. The multivariate uh, polynomial division is a much more complicated and subtle uh, story. So we have our monomials that are built of, of powers of all these different uh, of the different uh, variables. Again, x1 might be l1 dot k1, x2 l2 dot k4, and so on and so forth. And one needs to choose an ordering of them because these constructions, and in fact, even the results of division and things like that are not independent uh, of, the, of the ordering. 
And then we built something called a Grobner basis, which is a special set of generators that allows us to answer these questions uh, in an algorithmic way. So at least for the younger members of the audience, you might, you might be thinking that Grobner was the guy who actually invented this idea or invented the algorithm for producing a Grobner basis, but that's actually not true. Uh, the guy who invented these and uh, who wrote down the first algorithm was a guy called Buchberger. And uh, Grobner was his thesis advisor. So maybe that's an that's a, uh, encouragement to younger people to uh, name things after their thesis advisor. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go through the construction of the Grobner basis. It's, uh, there's by now many different algorithms, and it is uh, actually an important area of research in uh, computational algebraic geometry because the uh, the worst case uh, for for worst case data, these uh, most existing algorithms are actually doubly exponential. So if there if there are better algorithms out there, then uh, it would be good to uh, to know them. <clears throat> So the utility of the Grobner basis is that it makes the polynomial di division actually independent of the order. And uh, you can then just divide in, in a kind of more naive way by elements of the, of the Grobner basis. It doesn't really matter which order you do that. And um, if, you, if after finishing that division, you get a zero remainder, that's equivalent to the uh, question of ideal membership. In other words, can you actually write a given polynomial Q2 as a sum of uh, a weighted sum by polynomials of the uh, elements of the, of the ideal? Now, any set of generators can be written in terms of another. So you get something called the cofactor matrix. Uh, what won't really matter for us, uh, us today. Um, there's, uh, again, another aside that won't be important uh, today, but is, is kind of related to uh, Fernando's talk, is that this is also the technology you can use for solving uh, equations of, of the following form. So suppose you're, you want to find a solution. So you have some set of polynomials P, and you want to know, are there other polynomials S and J? such that this equation holds. So this is, is a form, it's uh, in some sense, the, the polynomial analog of diaphantine equations. I mean, if you had equations like this and you were willing to have rational solutions, it's true that it's just doing linear algebra. But when you insist that the solutions be uh, polynomials, then it's actually non-trivial. And these are known as uh, syzygy equations. And again, the solutions, again, turns out to be a vector space you can build into Grobner, Grobner bases. And uh, this is the key tool uh, in the language of, of uh, algebraic geometry for finding these special uh, vectors and surface terms that, uh, that Fernando uh, talked about uh, yesterday. So where does this uh, come in for us? So we're going to one can do this in two different ways. Um, because of the kind of scaling behavior of, of these Grobner basis algorithms, I mean, in the planar double box, it doesn't matter so much, but in more complicated examples, uh, it's perhaps better to proceed iteratively. So you proceed degree by degree, you compute the Grobner basis, and then you ask for every, let's say you compute the Grobner basis of degree two, numerators, these are polynomials, and then you ask for each of the degree three ones, does it have zero remainder or not? In other words, can it be expressed in terms of the degree two objects that we have or not? And then the ones that are independent, you retain and then you iterate this. And, or you could just compute the, the Grobner basis all at once and then look at what things are, are of different uh, degrees. So uh, when you do that, then uh, you find that these numbers, in fact, most of these numerators are, in a sense, trivially related to numerators of lower degree. So, of course, the two ones at, uh, at degree two are, of course, independent. There's nothing of lower order. 
But of the 18 at degree three, only four are independent. Of the 89 at, at degree four, uh, only four independent. In fact, it turns out that everything in degree five you can write in terms of, of uh, lower order degrees. So, I mean, just looking ahead a little bit, of course, the, I'm going to show you a, a toy uh, example of um, kind of hints of the simplifications uh, that you get by using the, the finite integrals. But of course, if you've constructed an integrand, you can just use these Grover bases to do the division and you know, separate out the finite ones and, and reorganize uh, the structure. So, um, Sorry, I'm just talking. Do you have an understanding of the zero in the far? So you're talking still about the final double box. Yes, so I know about uh, five degree magneto. And uh, do you have an understanding why that you express? Um, you know, um, I'll come back to that. I, I think there you can sort of give a hand waving argument, but I, I don't. I don't know of any deep, uh, deep. Uh, reason. Um, it is a feature that you see, I mean, in other examples. Uh, yes, but I mean, topology that will change. It, yeah. the, the, the precise number of says no change. These are not in only Yeah. Six what? What's how six is you diverging? Uh, so, um, but actually, power six will come back in the end. Okay, so um, I think everyone agreed, or at least the majority of people voting agreed that the uh, numerator I showed earlier, which is actually the simplest, you know, the, the random looking uh, degree four one, uh, did not particularly have a, an illuminating structure. So now the question is, can you uh, express these in a nicer packaging? And here, it's, uh, I would say it's kind of done in a bespoke way. We don't really have an algorithm uh, to, to do it, certainly not to pick the simplest uh, representation. And the key here is, is to um, do things in grand determinants. So the way at least this example we did is just to write down all grand determinants that you know, seemed as though they would be uh, useful objects. And then you can ask the question, are the two governor bases equivalent? And if they are, then you have a complete set. And you can do it also in a more pedestrian way by looking at the remainder of every a solution by the Grobner basis constructed of the, of the other. Um, and uh, so these are, are two uh, are the two simple ones for the, the degree two. And um, it turns out that actually all of the basis elements can be written very simply in terms of either products of grand determinants or Things that are in a sense really lower topology because they have a propagator denominator that collapses uh, one of the propagators, but they come out of the analysis the way we've done it. So, we can it. so if we look at the um, at the double box, then um, the uh, you you get the, those two, and then there there's essentially two additional ones that are full topology at, uh, at rank three and really nothing more at rank four. There are additional numerators, but they all have uh, propagator uh, denominators. And in a sense, um, in, in a partial answer to your question, it's, it's a reflection of the fact that there are a rearrangement. Of, so a grand matrix, at least a full rank grand matrix is in a sense a, a product of two epsilon tests. And so there are rearrangement of the entities that you get between different grand determinants. And it's not, not completely obvious to me why that means any grand that you write down that is a higher degree can, can get rearranged. But it's what it is. So let's think a little bit about why, why the grams are, are kind of the natural objects. So we know that. Say at least in the case of the planar double box, that all the candidate singularities are all logarithmic. So that means if you have even a fractional power of either the loop momentum or the loop momentum uh, dotted into some external invariant, then that's enough to make the integrand. It doesn't necessarily make it final, but it makes it integral. 
And the, this basic kind of ground determinant has both of those properties. So first of all, it scales as one power of this particular loop moment. So that's going to get rid of the soft singularity if it happens to be uh, at L1. And then if L1 is collinear to K1, this thing is also going to vanish. That, that vanishing um, is actually more like the square root of L1 dot K1. That's good enough. And so, of course, if you combine a gram like that with, with the appropriate external momentum for both L1 and L2, then you're going to get something which heuristically uh, is going to, so the, the numerator is going to vanish in the dangerous singular regions. And because these singularities are just logarithmic, any power of vanishing, the fractional power of vanishing, is good enough. OK, so. Um, there's an interesting subset of, of uh, finite numerators, which are what I call uh, evanescent uh, numerators. So these are going to give the numerators, which by design give you an integral which is manifestly a order of epsilon. So if you're only computing through that order in perturbation theory, you can simply throw it away. And equivalently, that will give you, if it decomposes, for example, under IBP identities to some other set of masters, that gives you a new identity. It's not an IBP identity. It says that that combination of masters is order epsilon or for practical purposes of zero. And the way we do that is that we're going to uh, require, in addition to the finiteness, we also require the numerator to vanish when the loop momenta are taken to be four dimensional. So the loop momenta here are d dimensional, they have this epsilon dimensional component. But um, if we set it to zero, then we're going to require that the uh, numerator uh, vanish. And in practice, you do that by putting in a representation of loop momentum, let's say, in terms of, of four uh, arbitrary four-dimensional uh, momenta, and then where the coefficients are free. And uh, then you require that these original coefficients in the uh, numerator, um, that they, if, if there's multiplying something non-vanishing, if they vanish, that gives you additional linear equations. So you're going to get a smaller set of solutions. And it turns out they're, again, naturally expressible as ground determinants. And um, the this is really more for the commentary for the, for the experts that, at least in the planar double box, the kind of relation you get is not that useful. But you get things that are genuinely uh, novel when you go to, when you go to three groups. So in the three loop ladder, now the numbers are, are starting to be much more impressive. If you look at the finite ones, then by the time now you can go up to degree seven, there's quite a large number of, of independent numerators. But in fact, most of them are just polynomials times lower order. So you actually have, um, here you just have 17 uh, independent uh, numerators. And uh, here, if you're looking at the, uh, the these evanescent ones, then you have eight of them up through, uh, through rank six. But again, the highest rank ones are, are typically uh, going to be really, they really should be assigned to lower topologies because they have uh, factors of the, of the uh, propagator denominators uh, inside. So that from a, Again, it's through rank three that you find the truly independent ones that preserve the topology, and for the evanescent ones, through, uh, through rank five. Whoops, I see there's actually a typo here. Hold on. Just that in the draft. Um, okay, so let's just see one, uh, one example here of, uh, of the use of these new integrals and kind of some of the hopes. Uh, that uh, that we have. So we look at the very simplest uh, two loop amplitudes. It's a four gluon amplitude where um, where all of the gluon helicities are uh, are positive, and because the, the tree level amplitude vanishes, the one loop amplitude for this helicity configuration is finite, and that means that whereas in general a two loop amplitude will have a one over epsilon to the fourth. The leading singularity here, the leading 
uh, IR divergence can just be a one over epsilon squared. And if we go, we're going to compare kind of a canonical basis, which is something that comes out of the standard machinery uh, for solving uh, differential equations, with a basis where we've replaced some of the double boxes with the finite. So that's the only modification we can kind of reorganize anything else here, which of course we should have, but one step at a time. So um, if we look at that, I don't get much transparency for that. Then um, it's a little bit of a busy transparency. These are the two numerators that we've already seen. Um, this again is our, our planar uh, double box into which these guys get inserted. And um, so one of the things that's um, that's interesting here is that when you go to this basis, first of all, you get a an explicit epsilon in front of the representation, which is not true in the final. So you already see that the leading uh, singularity is going to be of lower order because the, the worst integral inside is still one over epsilon to the fourth. Now, moreover, um, um, so this is not necessarily the right basis for solving differential equations, right? Different different courses for for different purposes. The the um, here I think it, you could actually do it, but in general, the these this kind of basis using finite angles may not be the best choice for actually solving the differential equation. What is H? Is, is, it, is it the full? H, H is H is this uh, amplitude. I think. It might be. I mean, there there are. Uh, yeah, I think I think it is actually just the amplitude. So, okay. but but this amplitude is not other epsilon. Are there poles even inside? There are there are poles oh, outside. I mean, for example, this one is a one of epsilon to the fourth. And then, but that's also the thing. Yeah, because H goes into epsilon squared. Yeah. But still, I mean, if you I didn't show the canonical representation here, but there. Naively, the order one hour something before, which is of course also big, it's, it's canceled. Um, so, what happens here is that um, so these integrals are finite, they're multiplied by order of epsilon. And so, again, uh, this order in, in perturbation theory, you can simply toss them out. So, you, you have a simpler uh, representation. Now, of course, this amplitude is a little bit special, but the the other thing that um, we can look at is in the in this canonical basis and in the modified basis, we can pick the coefficients which are in a certain sense the largest. I think this was just done by counting the lead counts. Sophisticated. And you can see that in the modified basis, the the worst coefficient in a sense is is simpler and I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't necessarily consider 3,398 a particularly simple number, but it's definitely better than you know 239,397. So, you know, in terms of both the size and the kind of complexity of the the coefficients, then they it looks simpler. And so this is this is kind of encouraging because we've just taken one small step, and it's at least Producing some uh, some aspects which are are nice. Okay, so we've we mostly looked at these locally uh, finite integrals, and where so, is it? Well, the numbers when you leave the polynomial, is it what makes simpler or not? Um, makes the intuition. I mean, you know, that's a, it's way too early to answer that question, but. Um, the the intuition is that if you isolate the infrared singularities both in a smaller set of properly chosen integrals, um, then the remaining pieces are going to be simpler. So the intuition, but at the end of the day, we have to do a lot more work before we can really really test this. The, the other thing that, that this may make possible is that another thing that, that happens that you can do in one loop, and 
I don't think there's really any been any exploration in part of so we'll correct me if you guys have done this that the when you start with loop momentum in the numerator, then you'll typically get a spray not just of integrals, but also of dotted integrals, and they have uh, unphysical uh, singularities in front of them. But the kind of prototype of that is, um, is where you get, um, for example, the, the two mass triangle has, has a one over say, S1, S2, one over S1 minus S2. Now, this is a spurious singularity, but in the triangle itself, it's canceled by the fact that you have, um, it's, it's given by, um, Simon, um, that the, the actual integral is gonna be something like, uh, ha have a, um, a log of S1 over S2 divided by this, so that they both will vanish at the same point, so it's not actually singular. So you have more generally, um, when, when you start to have uh, tensor integrals, then you'll get this raised to various powers, and there'll be some dotted bubble that gets subtracted so that the ensemble uh, has no spurious singularity. But each of the integrals alone may in general have a spurious a singularity. So, so in one loop, in specific cases, you can kind of assemble these things into functions which are manifest in three of, of these uh, singularities, which is numerically a, a good thing. And uh, I think this, if one reorganizes the integrals in this way, it also will make it easier to, to hunt for those kinds of combinations at, uh, at higher loops. So I mentioned that uh, at the very beginning that in addition to the one where the uh, integrators, I shouldn't have said finite here, really integral is what it means over the momentum space. Uh, there are other things where you can have cancellations between different divergences. So the, whereas the, the locally finite integrals, you could just do them in four dimensions. So that's, for example, integrals that um, you could try to feed through Eric Panzer's uh, hyperinch package which you couldn't do with the original integral. Uh, these integrals um, still, you cannot do them in, in four dimensions because they're finite because of an epsilon over epsilon uh, cancellation. And uh, in the UV case, UVIR case, it's, it's actually clear how to build uh, the general form of that. You start, for example, for the planar double box with the numerator, which is itself evanescent. So if you didn't have the polynomial in front, you get an integral of order epsilon, but then you put in a polynomial, which is of, of degree one in, uh, in, in L1 and degree uh, one in L2. That's something which is overall degree six, so it's UV divergent, and the uh, divergence will cancel between the UV and the IR, so the overall UV climate. And for the IR, IR ones, it's the, we don't really understand the, the systematics yet. It's, it's much more complicated. You have to look at the Landau equations, you know, the solutions of the Landau equations, so kind of singular surface by singular surface. And with that, I will come to my uh, summary slide. So I tried to outline the beginnings of the of a program to uh, to reorganize the uh, bases of master integrals in degree of divergence. The first steps there are looking at at uh, for finite integrals and also for evanescent. Integrals. So the things that are kind of uh, would be nice to know is is there a simple algorithm that can kind of pick out the simplest uh, grand determinants rather than just kind of having to play with them and find them by hand. And um, then we're, I think there's more, more work that one can do in, in known examples to try and see the, the impact on the structure and amplitudes. In the two of the case, we haven't looked at the, at the NHV amplitude yet, for example. So if there are any other questions, I'm happy to try and answer them. Yeah, yeah. Well, in the 
is to solve it, uh, not us. Um, so uh, this was actually Pavel's uh, specialty. And so his code was terrible at the beginning, and now it's actually pretty good. And what does that mean, pretty good? The, uh, I think that um, doing, let's say, two of pentagons and uh, all the planar fluid ones, that's, that's straightforward. And in fact, it's, he, can, he can do things where already the IDP codes cannot, cannot handle the degrees where the IDP codes just run out of steam. So um, the, I don't know whether he's, so there's, the, the real question is, for example, the you not bring it through um, at four point. And there are subtleties with the, this analysis and the subtleties of the Lando equation, which I don't know that he's fully true. Um, but I, I believe that at least in terms of the performance, you should be able to do it, but that's, that's more my faith. Perhaps also for well, uh, you mentioned that the planar has a more complicated uh, integrated structure. Have you explored any? So, um, so yes, and um, the at least at two loops, uh, it's kind of a. So what happens is that there's a vertex where you can get three soft lines coming together. And that means that in principle you could get power law to them. But okay, you go through the random analysis and then uh, you find that there's no exotic regions. You can still have raw soft image, soft similarity and stuff. So now you have more instead of just one over one to cancel. You do that, you get a set of numerators, you can write them to this graph. So that, that all works fine. But the issue um, that's a little bit more subtle is that. So, for example, the non planar double box, as you know, there's no need for the region. So, uh, if, you, if you impose momentum conservation, then there are uh, potentially zeros of the denominator inside the integration region. And maybe someone out there knows how to deal with this general. So, the two is a simple one. Loops. I don't know, some of them are. But it, it may also be that the four points just breaking the minimum conservation standard or just violating it. So, so in principle, I could take some of these grounds yes. and put them and have them in one of our parameterizations. Yes. Uh, some of the nice features is that yes. Should I expect something about the structure of the positions? Maybe they are. Yes. So, so that is the hope and. Let's say there's there's epsilon evidence, maybe more than epsilon evidence, but there's no guarantee. So I, I should mention that actually this is um, so one of the questions is can you construct a set of IDP vectors that respect those requirements? And the answer is yes. But so that's what you have to put in the end and make it bridge somewhere. Is there any connection? Uh, have you looked into common Plato's way of constructing what we could classify them? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a very brute force way of doing it, like basically adding the stones to the mountain edges. Yeah, and I, I mean, at the end of the day, you have one set of finite angles and another set of finite angles. All these things expressed in terms of those, but I, I doubt that. that Versions of two. Is it, it, you know, here you're really trying to do things in a natural, in a natural way, respecting the structure of the similarities. 
Okay, I don't see any other questions. Let's spend baby again. We have our uh, gathering this afternoon for this session. Yeah. See you at the next time.